Hi everyone! So a little while ago I mentioned wanting to do some more research-based videos as I've really enjoyed doing the trademark videos and I've done some research on brands and different products in the past. I had so much fun researching those that I really wanted to do some more similar videos like that. So I decided to start by talking about Urban Decay. Most of my research-based videos seem to start with Urban Decay. Uh, it's just a really good starting place for me. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the brand's history, the origin behind the brand, not so much about specific products in this video, although I do have a few ideas to talk about some Urban Decay products and stuff relating to some trademarks and dead trademarks and a lot of that kind of stuff. So I have spent probably the last two weeks or so doing some research. I will have a list of sources in my description box, not really organized, not like full citations there, um, but I tried to include just some general information. Some of the articles will be behind a paywall, just an FYI. But if you are interested in doing any kind of research, not just makeup related, but anything, uh, make sure to check out your local library because there are so many resources available there. So you probably have some access to some of these things if you are interested in reading from like other newspapers and, and uh, magazines and different journals and things like that. So we'll call this a little history of Urban Decay. We've got Cisco, Jane Austen, horses, get ready. So I'm gonna assume that most people are probably familiar, at least on some level, with Wendy Zomner, the chief creative officer for Urban Decay. She's often noted as the co-founder and sometimes even the sole founder of Urban Decay. To quote, a Cosmo article, Wendy Zomner co-founded and launched Urban Decay, an edgy line of makeup in fun, interesting colors out of her Laguna Beach, California bungalow. And according to Urban Decay and their website, here's their origin story. Urban Decay was born in Southern California in 1996 when we disrupted the industry's sea of pink-dominated counters. Badass, cruelty-free, high-performance makeup. Reinvention over perfection. Inspiration without replication. Kindness over cruelty. Unsubscribe from beauty telling you to be pretty. Be whatever you want to be. Pretty different. To be a little more specific, a story is often told about Wendy mixing together various nail polishes in her little California bungalow with a woman named Sandy Lerner. And we'll get to her in a minute. In more recent stories about Urban Decay, and there have been quite a few, uh, there were quite a few articles and recaps about the brand's history back in 2016 when they released their 20th anniversary capsule collection, which included some revamped versions of their original lipsticks, nail polishes, as well as some eyeshadows. Because in 1996, they launched their first round of products. 10 lipsticks, and 12 nail polishes. So nail polish is definitely what brought this brand to fruition. There was a lot of interest at that time for new and different nail polish hues. Quite notably, Chanel had released a nail polish called Vamp, which was a Time Magazine product of the year in 1995. It took the nail polish industry by storm, and it quadrupled sales expectations. So let's make our way back to 1995. As previously mentioned, Sandy Lerner was involved with Urban Decay. She was actually the founder, and you might say the co-founder, but not technically with Wendy. Sandy Lerner may not be a name that is familiar to you, but you're probably familiar with Cisco. Cisco Systems Inc. is a multinational technology conglomerate in the heart of Silicon Valley. Cisco was founded in 1984 by Leonard Bozak and his girlfriend at the time, later wife, Sandy Lerner. Sandy was fired from Cisco in 1990 and her husband resigned in protest and they walked away with about $200 million. Shortly thereafter in 1992, Sandy decided to follow her dreams and she purchased a mansion that belonged to Jane Austen's brother in England. The house holds the library of the Center for the Study of Early Women's Writing, 1600 to 1830, and is used as a writer's retreat as well. In 1993, Sandy met a woman named Patricia Holmes. Patricia owned a horse training facility and Sandy wanted to import horses to the US from England. By 1995, the two were really close friends and Patricia stayed involved with Sandy's horses even when she didn't have a contract. And that same year, the two women flew over to England for a horse show and also to import some horses back to the US. This trip coincided with Sandy's 40th birthday and she decided she wanted to pub crawl. 
So it's important to note here that Sandy really favored an alternative kind of style when it came to her makeup and her clothes favoring black and favoring black nail polish. Patricia wasn't really keen about this, but Sandy really wanted her to play along, so she encouraged her to find some middle ground. She gave Patricia a bunch of polishes and said, hey, figure it out, mix something together, come up with something that is suitable, but that you'll also enjoy wearing. So Patricia ended up layering a black polish and a raspberry sort of shade together and came up with a purple polish color. Once they were back in California and they were waiting for the horses to clear their quarantine, Sandy and Patricia were spending some time in Sandy's condo and they were layering polish because they were trying to recreate that party purple that Patricia had made. One color ended up looking like a bruise, another color Patricia wanted to call plague. They talked about how the names and the shades they were creating had kind of like an urban theme. And they kept trying to think of other names as well. So they threw out other names that would kind of follow along with the theme, such as mildew, smog, oozy, and oil slick. Len Bozak, Sandy's husband, overheard this conversation and he said, what about decay? They decided that Urban Decay was a good fit for the overall concept. A company was born. Sandy said, we will hire people to work for us. We will do everything we can to get the company going and then we'll be creative and other people will do the work. So we'll have time to continue riding the horses. Sandy immediately contacted her business consultant, David Soward, and asked him to see if they could trademark Urban Decay. Sandy is noted as telling her housekeeper, it was all Pat's idea over in England, but I've got the money to make it work. And she hoped to sell Urban Decay to Estee Lauder for $50 million. Neither woman had any cosmetic industry knowledge, but they spent months doing research. And they even met with a graphic artist to design a logo and start working on advertising. Does pink make you puke? A tagline they had settled on for the first run of ads back in 95 before products were launched. A follow-up ad, Burn Barbie Burn, had to be discarded after Mattel threatened a lawsuit. So Sandy, Patricia, David, and the graphic artist Andrea Kelly met to discuss the company. They decided to invest half a million dollars from Ant Capital, which was a venture capital partnership that was Sandy's and her husband's and David Sowards. At the next meeting, David introduced Wendy Zomner as an advertising and marketing specialist. From 1994 to 95, Wendy was an account supervisor for Wonderman Cato Johnson, an ad agency, and she was a friend of David's former fiance. Wendy gave a presentation which wowed the group and they decided to hire her. Unbeknownst to Patricia at the time, however, they made Wendy chief operating officer with a percentage of ownership for the brand. Unsure of her position with the brand, Patricia kept asking for clarification. What exactly was her role? So she sent a fax to Sandy's attention asking for her role and responsibilities in writing. David intercepted the fax and reached out to Patricia himself. What did she want? One, two percent? Patricia decided to double down and work harder, and she kept insisting she was a co-founder of the brand. An early press release from 1996 stated the idea for Urban Decay was born after Lerner and her horse trainer, Pat Holmes, were sitting around in the English countryside. Sandy was even quoted telling the story in an article for The Examiner and in a CNN interview around the same time. In a 1995 New York Times article, earning it, setting her sights on a pinkless palette, there was no mention of Patricia, or Wendy for that matter. The only other Urban Decade employee mentioned was the president, David Sauer. By March of 96, Patricia was formally offered a 1% stake in Urban Decay. She didn't accept and decided to consult an attorney, but still attended board meetings and even gave presentations as to the work she was doing to help further the brand. Wendy has said that Urban Decay's beginnings were difficult, with her mixing products out of her home for a lab to match, and she had to steal contact information for a Nordstrom buyer in order to be able to make a sales pitch, as well as directly chasing down and targeting alternative musicians like Shirley Manson and Gwen Stefani. Shirley Manson has claimed Lady Danger from MAC as her signature lip in the 90s. Gwen Stefani has cited MAC as well, mentioning on multiple occasions that Russian Red is and was a go-to. Curiously, as both Manson and Stefani have been listed as Urban Decay inspirations and early lovers of the brand, there are little mentions of either using the brand in the 90s. Gwen had an Urban Decay collab in 2015, and she said, when Urban Decay came to me to collaborate, I immediately thought it was a perfect match. The way they've built their company is very similar to my aesthetic and approach. It's it's all about creative self-expression, being strong, and not being afraid to go outside of the box.
No doubt both stars use the brand, but it seems a little bit more like a marketing ploy than being entirely genuine because Urban Decay never really had to struggle. Despite being an indie brand, there were deep pockets and many connections already built in. So let's flash back to 1996. As a result of Patricia's attendance at a sales presentation when she referred to herself as co-founder of Urban Decay, Sandy instructed Wendy to draft a dress code and official history of Urban Decay. Apparently it was a real error in judgment to allow Patricia to attend the sales presentation because she did not project the appropriate image. The official history, as proposed in the memo, omitted any reference to Patricia. Eventually, it got to the point that David told Patricia not to attend any further board meetings because she was no longer welcome at Urban Decay. Patricia filed a lawsuit in August of 1996. Speaking to Forbes, Sandy said, she, Patricia, didn't have a role in the company and my gardener didn't have a role either. She hung on for a while, kind of in a groupie status, because she was my friend and she had my horses. But by 1997, the jury found in favor of Patricia Holmes on every cause of action, and she was awarded $1.4 million in damages. Although they appealed, by 1999, the court remained in favor of Patricia. Also in 1997, Urban Decay and Sandy Lerner decided to sue Revlon. They believed that Revlon's streetwear line infringed on their trademarks. They settled out of court. Revlon's streetwear line lasted a few more years before being discontinued as interest and sales decreased. One year following the Lerner v. Holmes appeal, in 2000, Urban Decay was sold to LVMH, Moet, Hennessy, Louis Vuitton, for an undisclosed amount. This seems to mark the end of Sandy Lerner's involvement with the brand. Sandy has since dedicated most of her time to her Virginia farm and Jane Austen, even writing a Pride and Prejudice sequel in 2011 with the pen name Ava Farmer, a Virginia farmer. But Wendy Zomner stayed with Urban Decay. Although the brand didn't last very long with LVMH, unsurprisingly, because LVMH at this time had cosmetic brands like Dior, Givenchy, and Guerlain, although they did have the wildly successful benefit and make up forever as well, products like lip gunk, all over body glitter, and heavy metal glitter liners weren't quite products that fit in. Not that Urban Decay was trying to fit in. LVMH had acquired Hard Candy and Urban Decay around the same time, but sold them both two years later at the end of 2002. The Fallop Group purchased both brands, and with Wendy as creative director for both, they decided to lower Hard Candy's price point, leading to their partnership with Walmart, and increase Urban Decay's price point. Wendy said at the time, to me, Urban Decay has always been about beauty with an edge. Everything has to be dangerous, feminine, and fun. It's not for everyone. Hard candy has more of a broad appeal. During the time with the Fallot Group, in 2006, Urban Decay released their 24-7 eyeliners, a staple eyeliner for many. Urban Decay was sold yet again in 2009, this time to private equity firm Castanea Partners. Urban Decay was growing steadily and was arguably more profitable at this time than when they were with LVMH, but it seems that the Fallot Group simply needed cash fast. Castanea was excited for Urban Decay and expressed many ideas to bring the brand to new markets and new audiences. And they did so in a very big way. 2010 brought the first Alice in Wonderland collaboration, which sold out before it officially launched, and the Naked Palette, aka the iPhone of eyeshadow. Consumers weren't really into the edgy Urban Decay vibe by the late 2000s. Comments were frequent about how unwearable and garish and tacky the brand was, and neutrals, well, Neutrals are for everyone. So having embraced social media fully from the early 2000s with MySpace to Facebook, Twitter, and of course, beauty blogs, Urban Decay made the Naked Palette the must-have makeup product. With some manufactured supply and demand, the Naked Palette could not stay in stock. And it became the most talked about eyeshadow palette perhaps ever. We have sold over a billion dollars worth of naked palettes since its launch in 2010. Wendy was quoted at saying in 2018. So to no surprise, a big gun came calling. L'Oreal decided they needed Urban Decay and they got them for a measly 350 million US dollars, which has certainly paid off for L'Oreal. Even in their 2013 financial report, they noted an increase of Urban Decay sales by 42.5%. Urban Decay has been with L'Oreal for eight years now and still going strong, having established themselves as a must-have brand for makeup lovers of all ages, preferences, and skill levels. Has Urban Decay lost its edge? 
Many people say yes, having gone from anti-pink to looking like a clone of other higher-end makeup brands. The Urban Decay of 1996 probably wouldn't be too impressed with the kind of products that Urban Decay is releasing now. But what do you think? I'm really curious to know what you guys think. Should we let go of the Urban Decay of the past? Do you wish they would get edgy again? I mean, realistically, especially being owned by such a big brand by L'Oreal, Urban Decay would probably never have the same kind of edgy appeal that they had back in the 90s. So it seems unlikely that we would ever get that. But it's interesting to think about what they could do that would be a little bit more groundbreaking than some of the stuff they've been releasing. Arguably, they haven't really had any big groundbreaking monumental releases since the Naked palette. I mean, every Naked palette that has released has kind of become a big thing, but then they have the whole Naked line, and there really hasn't been a single product or a product line from Urban Decay that has made the same kind of impact because the Naked palette changed so much and it really was so influential for so many other brands as well. And some of the choices that Urban Decay was making back in the 90s were very influential. And you saw that reflected as more unique colors became sort of commonplace. Um, things that were more difficult to get were easier to get. And all of a sudden it was more accessible and it wasn't just at like a higher end level, like Urban Decay's price, as they kind of have kept raising their prices. But you you saw more stuff at the drugstore any of brands. There was more edgier colors, more shades available in a wide variety of finishes and formulas than there ever have been. And now, especially, there's so much more available and it's so easy to kind of get almost whatever you want because there are so many options out there. So I'm curious to hear from you. What do you think about Urban Decay's history and where do you think they are going to go from here? I, I'm, I'm just curious to hear people's opinions on the brands. Um, and if you have any other brand suggestions, if there are any other brands or products or anything that you would like me to explore a little further, please let me know. I am researching a couple of older brands right now to do some digging into brands that have been in existence for well over 100 years, but it's taking some time to do some research and I'm waiting for some sources to come to me. So, But I'm really curious to know if people would just be interested in a series like this because I have the most fun doing the research and talking about this stuff. So definitely let, let me know what you would like to see. If you have any other video suggestions, requests, ideas, any kind of feedback would be very, very, very much appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I hope we get a chance to chat soon. Bye for now.